feel like I need a redo now. <laughs> Our scripture today comes from Matthew 7, 9 through 11. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord. Father's Day. You know, there's a proposal out there right now to scrap both Mother's and Father's Day and rename them Guardian's Day because, you know, both holidays assume that a parent is either male or female. Now, <clears throat> I'm not too worried about Guardian's Day uh, creeping or edging out Mother's Day, but I'm a little bit worried about Father's Day. I read that 46% of kids get mom something and only 30% of kids get dad something. I think I've told you before that on Mother's Day, it's the day the most telephone calls are made throughout the year. And on Father's Day, it's the day the most collect calls are made <laughs> throughout the year. And, and Father's Day, well, you know, just being a father, it, it, it's... It's difficult because manhood has fallen into some confusion over the last few decades. You know, what makes a man? You know, the ideal man, he's, he's strong, but never a bully. He's tough, but tender. He's vulnerable and yet holds to his convictions. You know, the macho, domineering guy who bullies others, uh, we don't consider that person to be a man. But neither is the, the young man who's not grown up emotionally and is simply an insecure, selfish boy. Uh, that's not a man either. Because really, men and fathers are, are, are heroes, they're, they're role models. At least men and fathers carry the potential to be heroes and role models. Sadly, in our society today, we have a tendency to magnify a person's flaws and dismiss the person altogether. I'll give you an example. George Washington, an incredible, selfless man, considered throughout history as one of the greatest people of all time. Well, he's been recast as a wealthy landowner who hypocritically owned slaves. Now, never mind the fact that slavery was an accepted custom back then, or the fact that he treated his slaves with great tenderness and on his deathbed freed them all and had their education provided for. Here's what happens when we're overly critical of otherwise good men. There's a harmful result. Right now, men are opting out of marriage. Why? I think they're reacting rationally to the, the lack of incentives that society offers them to be fathers, husbands, and providers. You know, there's a quip, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. See? And, and it kind of shows how society no longer values the man in the home. You know, throughout history, men have been willing to work and sacrifice, sweat and bleed for the respect of their women and peers. But in a society that demeans them, you know, men are just walking away from this God-assigned role. You know, this one English professor wrote the words on the chalkboard. Woman, without her, man is nothing. Then he directed the students to punctuate it correctly. Okay? The men wrote, woman, comma, without her, man is nothing. The women wrote, woman, semicolon, without her, comma, man is nothing. Okay? So it's all in the perspective, right? And actually, God made her to need him, as well as the fact that if we all remember, it is not good for man to be alone, so I will make him a companion to complement him. And here's the problem. Uh, men have not been angels over the years. In fact, they've misused their masculinity in such a way that we've had to redefine masculinity away from self-centered, abusive behaviors, but... In that desire to get a balanced person, uh, the pendulum has swung too far, possibly. And we've now emasculated men, pretending that there's no real difference between a man and a woman. 
Well, there is a difference, and this was God's idea. And, and before we go any further, I, I would like to caution you to not make the mistake of transferring your earthly father's weaknesses onto your heavenly father's. You know, you might have had a strained relationship with your earthly father, but God comes to you and says, I have a love that is pure towards you. Um, you're safe with me. Um, you can have a connection to me, your heavenly father. And basically what Jesus is saying is, uh, let's get healed from the broken earthly father experience you might have had. Your heavenly father is not that way. And I think males and females, we all need to look to the perfect father, our heavenly father, to, to get our manhood healed. And men, you have an exceptional challenge and responsibility because God has shared his title as father with you. I'm not trying to put any pressure on you. But it's pretty big. Well, God made men strong so that they'd use their strength to protect women, children, and anybody else. It's a gift used to bless others who are weaker, that knight in shining armor. Okay? He cares for, protects, provides you know, for everybody else. Uh, that's the man that we all try to emulate. And I was reading about a shooting that took place in a movie theater, and three young men shielded their dates, and they all died so that their girls wouldn't. You know, their instinct was selflessly to use their strength to protect others. I'd say that was a courageous decision. And the word courageous comes from the Latin, which means heart. See, to have courage means to have heart. And this is different from the way the macho man was raised in the streets, where, you know, showing emotion, you know, that was a weakness. No, it's good for us to invest our hearts in the people around us. In fact, godly men give of themselves for others, even when it costs to do so. You're not going to believe this, that godly men actually cry. I was told, don't you ever cry? Hey. And for a number of decades, I didn't. Until I finally was able to, my dad wasn't around, shed a couple of tears, okay? That's just the way we were brought up. It's okay to let your heart be part of your walk through life. And, and godly men, we all surrender to a higher purpose. And, and let's talk about being a godly father. You know, the Bible has numerous character portraits of good and bad dads. Most were good men who were bad dads. King David, a man after God's own heart. Bad dad. He didn't discipline or invest in his kids when he should have which led to all kinds of family problems. In fact, one of his kids tried to kill him and take over his kingdom. You know, Aaron the priest and Eli the priest, both of them didn't discipline their kids. And what happened? When they served the Lord, God killed those kids right in front of them dead. Isaac never made peace between his sons, and the rivalry almost destroyed their family. In fact, as we were just going through, through Genesis right now, we would see that the sins of one patriarch were repeated in the next patriarch, were repeated in the next patriarch. You see, what we get wrong, our children are watching and tend to uh, imitate. Of course, there's people like Joshua, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, he's made a decision. This household belongs to God, and that's the direction we go. Philip, here's a guy who has four daughters. All four of them are raised up to become prophets. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And told fathers not to exasperate your children. And so, you know, I think it's kind of hard to be a Christian sometimes. And then you have the extra added responsibility of handling your wife correctly, not to mention the children that are in your family. Okay? Fatherhood is not for wimps. You know, I once saw a cartoon. A man was yelling to his wife, Honey, remember the real estate agent who said the people next door were angels? And then you can see in the background of the cartoon, they got a bunch of guys with Hell's Angels vests on the back, okay? In other words, things aren't always represented correctly. 
And, and right now, it's difficult to discern how to be a father. You know, I was brought up with a rather tough role model. Other people, they had Mr. Rogers as a father. Just that beautiful guy. Some, they had no father, and they had to figure it out. Some had bad fathers, and they had to undo the damage. And again, this is important because men carry God's title as father. So I'm going to suggest we take a peek at how God fathers us. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God so loved the world. You know, to be a godly father is to love your kids. The moment your kids were born, did you not automatically just love them? In fact, you know, we loved our kids while they were still in the womb. I used to talk to my little ones while they were still in mom's body because I wanted them to hear my voice and know my vibe so they automatically would, you know, prefer me. Okay? <clears throat> they didn't have to do anything to earn my love. I just loved them because they were mine. Friends, you are God's. And he loves you just because you belong to him. You don't have to do anything. The fact that you are means he loves you. And it's important that we tell them that you feel this way. Do you know how many times I've been at the bedside of people dying, and they'll be going over their life, and they'll say to me, you know, Pastor, I never heard my father tell me he loved me. I mean, here they are exiting life, and they're bringing up that. You can see the wound that it left. The lack of affirmation that somebody important loved me. You know, we men, we assume, of course, you know I love you. I mean, I feed you. I let you live in my house, don't, don't I? You know? No, that's not enough. You know, well, we have to open up emotionally. And the problem with us guys is, you know, we're used to conditional love. You know, hey, if you, if you uh, do what I told you to do, then I'll take you out to eat. Okay? And the kid's going, wow, you know, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I'm not going to eat. You know, we, we tend to create this conditional world where nobody feels safe. Adam and Eve, when God took them out of the garden, what did he do? He took care of them and made clothing for them. You say, yeah, but he kicked them out of the garden. Yes, he didn't want them to eat from the fruit of the tree of life so they would live forever in a sinful state. Even what we see as a negative experience was actually God's protection. Well... God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, we show love by giving. God, he gave his son to us to die for our sins. Sometimes love means sacrifice. And, and to have kids, it's costly. I remember when my son was born, I read in the, the newspaper that his son will cost you $300,000 between 1 and 18 years old. And I'm pretty sure he cost me all 300000 What the article did not say is that daughters cost more. <laughs> this one guy, he had his best friend over, and he sees his little one playing on the floor. He goes, well, there goes my boat. But he goes, what do you mean? He goes, no, I can't get a boat anymore. Why not? Well, I got to pay for the braces that are going to be coming, and I'm going to have to buy him a car when he succeeds, and I'm going to have to pay for his college tuition. I can't afford a boat, and by the time I can afford a boat, I won't want a boat anymore. But he wasn't really complaining. He was just talking about the sacrifices that come with parenting. You know, when you love somebody, you give them what's most important. And what's our most important commodity? Is it not our time? You know, to be a good father is to invest time into the relationship. Here's a scary thought. What would your wife and kids say is the most important thing to you? Your job? Your golf clubs? Your house? Your hobbies? Would they say your faith? You know, it's measured by where you invest your time. Little Becky, she was working on a class project. Her family picture that she drew was going to be imprinted on a plate that she would take home as a keepsake forever. And so she drew a picture of herself and her mother on one side and the, the, the puppy on the other side, and she etched it into the plate, and there it was. She took it home. The only problem was Becky's mom wasn't divorced. Becky's mom wasn't a single mom. 
Becky has a dad. But he didn't make the picture because he's never home. He was always at work. And so, in her mind, he wasn't part of the family. Dad took the, pic the plate, took it to his work, put it on the wall to help him remember how his priorities needed to be. You got to invest time if you want the relationship to work. And really, it's in what we give that we indicate the depth of our feelings for somebody. And Jesus clarified the Heavenly Father's disposition towards us in Matthew. He will not give us a snake when we ask for food. No. You who are evil, we know how to give good gifts. How much more will the Heavenly Father give good things to you? And in Luke's version, he says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to you? See, when God wants to give you something, the best gift that he gives is himself. Remember when the Israelites were being led through the desert, and in the daytime there was a pillar of cloud to follow. And at the nighttime there was a pillar of fire. There it was, the presence of God, available to see and be encouraged by every single day. It's interesting, though, is that pillar didn't cause the Israelites... Not to grumble, okay? See, that pillar was out at the edge of the camp. And so God, he rearranged things. And he brought his presence out from the edge of the camp. And he put himself directly into all of us. Right now we have the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's how intimate our relationship with God is. He's given us himself. You know, I was reading through the Sermon on the Mount. And 15 times Jesus refers to God as our Father. Now, when somebody says something 15 times, it's one of two things. It's your wife telling you to do something. Or it's somebody who's trying to drive home a new perspective, a fresh understanding. Jesus in, is inviting us into a personal relationship with Almighty God. In fact, at, at one section, Jesus tells us, to call God Father, and he uses the word Abba, which is Daddy. You know, one of my favorite memories is when Elijah, he, he's learning how to crawl, and he, he can't really talk yet, and he's, he's, you know, he crawls over my head, and he goes onto my nightstand, and half of his body's on the nightstand, and half of his body's on the bed, and there's a big chasm in between, and he realizes he's in a precarious place, and he goes, Daddy! So, you know, I slip my hand under his body, and he goes, Daddy. Then he goes, Daddy. <laughs> and I thought, wow, isn't that like God? You know, he went from fear to recognition to confidence. And you and I, what do we do? We cry out in fear, Daddy! But then we remember his promise, and we go, Daddy. And then we realize how much he loves us, and we go, Daddy. Okay? The Bible tells us throughout that our Heavenly Father is for us, He's going to protect us. He has a future and a hope, a plan. He's always with us. The promises are endless because that's His love for you. And I want to talk about this commitment that He's made to you. You know, a man was coming back from a business trip and he said, oh, I think I'll get my wife a small gift. So he goes to the cosmetic counter and says, hey, I'd like to bring my wife home some perfume. And so the, the clerk brings him a $90 bottle of perfume. He goes, oh, I was thinking of something a little less expensive. So she brings him a $60 bottle of perfume. And he goes, you know, still a little, little something less. And she brings him a $30 bottle of perfume. And he goes, you got anything cheaper? And she hands him a mirror. Okay. <laughs> Friends, when it comes to God loving you, he's not a minimalist. In fact, Romans 8, 32 says, He who did not withhold his own son, will he not freely give us all things? This is the extravagant manner that, that God loves you. He's given himself to you and everything that comes with him. You know, Ephesians 3, 20, To him who was able to do beyond what we ask or even imagine, this is the kind of relationship you have as the child of the Heavenly Father. Now, I tell you this not to make you feel entitled, 
but to show you the vastness of God's commitment to you. And we're talking about our kids and giving to them. You don't want to know one of the most primary ways to give to them is your words, your praise, your encouragement, your affirmation. And while that sounds like a no-brainer, most of us guys were brought up with fathers who didn't use encouraging words. You know, usually, what do you mean you got a B plus on the test? Why not an A? You know, we try our best and they're always critical. Well, I'm just trying to help them learn how to be a man, you know. And we, we grow up under this pressure. And, you know, encouragement is something that we all need and want. In fact, there's a measuring tool on a, on a marriage test. Words of affirmation, because it's a primary love language for, for most of us. And, and I want you to understand the power of your words. In Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I don't want you to underestimate you know, the emotional impact that you can have on your kids. A, a psychologist at Cal State Fullerton found that sons who have fond memories of their fathers we're more able to handle the day-to-day -day stresses of adulthood. Now, how is it that having a fond memory of your dad is going to help you handle life? It's because there was somebody that loved you unconditionally, who believed in you, who encouraged you, and so now that's set the pattern as you go forward into life. You see, friends, right now we're creating memories and we're shaping behaviors. Speaking of shaping behaviors, a woman came home from shopping and she had her hands filled with a bunch of grocery bags. You know, she had to kick the door open and she steps into the house and she sees that the house has been cleaned. She sees that it's been vacuumed into nice patterns. And she looks up at her husband and says, who did this? He said, I did. She drops all the bags and thrust herself upon him, starts smothering him with hugs and kisses. They fall over, break a chair. She's just passionately expressing her appreciation. The man comes away from that event and says, you know, <clears throat> I learned something valuable. Love is expressed in more than words. But you kind of have to admire this woman's ingenuity on how she's now going to get her floor vacuumed and her house cleaned regularly, huh? Well, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him. Friends, as fathers, we have expectations for our children. And as Christian fathers, it's that our children will believe in him. But this requires that we leave a spiritual legacy, a heritage. You know, Rick Warren, his father was a guy who over 50 years built over 150 churches. And so here's this man, this, this amazing ministry machine, and he's, he's on his deathbed. And he keeps repeating the phrase, one more for Jesus, one more for Jesus. And on his final day of life, he puts his hand on Rick's head and says, one more for Jesus. And so Rick takes this as his father's commissioning to him, and he goes forth into the ministry. And I think it's safe to say that Rick Warren has brought one more to Jesus. Amen? And I guess what I'm saying is we need to speak faith into our children's lives. You know, a lackadaisical approach to our spiritual life, the children are going to see, ah, it's not really that important. Okay? Maybe those unsurrendered areas of our lives are going to communicate to our kids, well, you know, God's not that important. Well, it says... Whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Friends, we have a vision for our children. It's that they make it to eternal life. You know, godly fathers, we have our kids' future in mind. You know, God has a future for you that you live with him forever. And it's our job to get them there. I was reading about a dog. It lived for the UPS truck's arrival. Okay? Okay. He'd hear the truck coming, and he'd run out to the doggy door, sprint out through the backyard, move up to the front yard, move down through a hole in the fence, and chase the truck all the way down the street. That was his joy in life. And then one day, the dog gets pancreatic cancer, and he has to be put down. 
So the owner takes the dog to the vet, and as they're sitting in the waiting room for the inevitable, a UPS truck shows up. And this dog, who's not responding to any petting or food, all of a sudden raises his head, starts wagging his tail. So the owner picks him up, takes him outside, and this dog who can't walk all of a sudden is trotting around the truck, checking out each tire. The driver brings him into the UPS truck, lets the dog explore the whole thing. You know what? I read that story and I'm thinking, the last thing that this got, dog got to do was experience the one thing he always wanted. And that's what Jesus has made available to us. He shows us the God that we long to know. He's made accessible to us the God that we plan on living with. He's given us access to the presence of God who we're going to spend eternity with. You know, our life's pursuit as Christians and our ultimate dream to be with him forever, Jesus has made God's UPS truck available for all of us. I think it's powerful. Jesus said, call no one father, for you have one father in heaven. And apparently the exception that was made was for us guys to share God's title. And I'm going to suggest that you and I follow this model to love and give and, and believe and plan on heaven with God. You know, when the Red Sox won the title back in, was it 2004, for the first time in 90 years, you know, you know the way we celebrate in America, we go destroying everything, you know, lighting buildings on fire, we're so happy. And, and so the county commissioner, Melissa Chivers, she's in Til Tifton, Massachusetts, and you know, it's a crisis, everybody's destroying everything, and so she said three things, law enforcement is doing what they can, churches gotta go to work in the community, and three, men have to step up. I thought, wow, you know, she understood the men that role pl that, that, that we play in, in righting the wrongs in society. We have the power to make an influence. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I saw that, that little, you know, clip on this father-daughter talking about her daddy and, you know, get a little frustrated, start thinking about all the opportunities that I missed. Wish that I could go back and spend more time and do it right. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like a carton of milk that ex whose expiration date is, is, is passed. I missed it. I blew it. It's over. The opportunity's gone. But that's when God's grace reaches into our lives. When we think the expiration date is passed, he says, no, actually, I can heal spoiled milk. The moment that you bring me into the, to your life, I can start making changes. And as long as you're breathing, as long as you can pray, as long as you can pick up the phone, write a letter, or send a text, the power of God can move to you, through you, to your children. You know, NASA, he's the son of Hezekiah one of the great kings of Israel, one of the best kings of Israel, okay? But at the end of, Men of Hezekiah's life, he wasn't focused on God like he used to be. And you know what happened to him? He has a son named Manasseh who becomes the most evil, horrible, worst king in the history of Israel. You go, what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. He forgot to pass his faith on to his son. He was focused on other things. He didn't deposit his, his love for God into his child, and he didn't tell his son that this is a priority. He didn't let his son know this is worth fighting for. Well, Manasseh destroys the nation, and the next thing that happens is he has a son, and his son's name is Josiah, and he becomes the best king that Israel's ever had. You see, he decided to stop the cycle of sin and evil. And, and I don't know where you are. Maybe you're a great dad, and man, do we love you. Maybe you weren't a great dad, 
and you get to be redeemed. But all of us right now, we can step in and change the cycle for ourselves and for our children. Let me end our message here. This one son said, I gave my father $100 and said, buy yourself something that will make your life easier. So he went out and bought a present for my mother. (laughs) Father's Day advice from me to you guys. Most of all, on Father's Day, Heavenly Father, thank you. Amen? Go forth and have a God with you.